Hi, everyone, and welcome to Machine Dreams, the show where the people building AI talk honestly about what's working, what's not working, and what is next. My name is Kola Wale Samuel Adebayo. I am a technology analyst and a Forbes columnist, and I'm joined here by my co-host. Hi, everyone. I'm Leah Stern. I'm a global communications strategist and venture capitalist, and I'm happy to be here. Hey, Sam, how you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? You look great. Oh, you look great. <laughs> Hot over there in Nigeria? Hot as hell. Uh, you but, bet. But it's, it's been good. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're joined today by Toby Morgan Hitchcock, co-founder and CEO of Surreal DB. It's one of the most talked about data platforms for AI native applications. Toby, so great to have you. Thank you for being here. Yeah, really good to chat with you. Yeah. So Toby, be, before we dive in, um, I just wanted to know, I'm, I was just a little curious about it. What's something people might not know about your journey, you know, the human origin story behind your company. I saw that you co-founded with your brother. I found that interesting because um, it's not often that you see that. Um, so yeah, tell us about that. Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting story. And you know what? My background isn't even in, in databases per se originally, right? So I did my master's in, in, uh, uh, and my master's thesis focused on databases and uh, and the theory behind that. But before that, my uh, my experience is in kind of large scale systems, uh, big data, and and software as a service, but not databases per se. But it was back in 2015, and yeah. you know it's always longer than it seems on the outside, right? So you know this has been an open source product for three years or just about three years now. But really, we've been thinking about this since 2015 and trying to work out how do we actually go and build this this multi-model system where we're trying to replace multiple different parts of the tech stack. And as I say, that journey started in 2015. We were using different databases, time series, document, graph, relational. And I think in a similar way to most organizations or most developers, you know, they're using a Kubernetes tech stack, containerized with lots of different database types. They're having to build applications that talk and communicate with all of these different database types. Uh, and this was the struggle we had. Right, and we wanted to simplify the tech stack. We wanted to make it more performant overall. Mm -hmm. We wanted to not have to duplicate data up between all of these different uh, platforms. And we decided one day just to ask ourselves, you know, can we build something which replaces all of these things in a single platform, which is built for the cloud or for the modern way of, of doing things, i.e. if something crashes, it comes up and doesn't assume that there's any history uh, in, the, uh, in the cluster. Uh, and can we actually do this in a way that's performant? Uh, and it took us a while to work out from the very bottom up, you know, from the key value store all the way up to the, to the query engine, how to do it. But we open sourced it in 2022 and haven't really looked back because the, the interest in the product has been uh, amazing. With that being said, there is a beauty in making something complex feel simple. What has been the hardest part of making a multi-model system that developers do not run away from? Yeah, it's a good question. I think you have to you have to reimagine almost the entire stack. So, so for instance, with SurrealDB, you can go from running a single node server or even a kind of database running inside Python, so inside the, the process, all the way up to running 25 nodes, 50 nodes in a cluster mm -hmm. and storing hundreds of terabytes of data. And so the way that you design the database, the way that you design the behavior of, of how that works you have to take into account all of those different aspects every single time you build in a feature. So that's always, that is always tricky. Um, in addition to that, you know, the query language itself, albeit it's very close to traditional SQL or ANSI SQL, it does have to have some slight differences in order to incorporate time series data, document querying, graph querying as well. And then, and then really at the base of it, you have to re-architect everything right down to the to the hard drive or the operating system you know in order to do what you want to achieve you you have to look at the key value store how data is written to disk uh, the query language how it operates over data before it writes to that key value store and then and all the way up to like the distributed protocol so really it's uh i think the most complex thing is you know reimagining the, the entire stack not just one part like the query layer or something like that so before um, ChatGPT blew up the entire conversation about AI, you know, there was always the talk about big data and databases. But a lot of the conversations that I'm seeing um, today, 
but is around AI infrastructure and particularly databases. What is crazy? What is so crazy about databases? Why are databases essentially so important to the AI revolution? Yeah, I think it is a good, it's a good question because databases come in many different forms, right? You know, you have databases that are uh, very good at large amounts of data, databases that are very good at small amounts of data, but very fast operations in memory. I think in the AI, in the AI space, and this is why it's becoming maybe not quite yet, but people know it's an issue or know it's going to be a building issue. Um, and that is people are trying, you know, more so than before, people now know that in order to get the best results out of a, a large language model, you have to be pushing in vectors. And that's obviously the most popular form of data nowadays yeah. or at the moment. But you also have to be pushing in temporal data, time series data, event-based data, graph relationships, you know, understanding how that data works. Vectors work to an extent, and they work to a very good extent. But the human mind, and hence therefore an LLM, or in, its, you know, in a way how an LLM works, is it doesn't work on just here are a load of facts. It has to work on these are a load of facts, which relate to these other facts, which relate to this other knowledge. So it's about combining lots of different types of, of data together. So I think the first thing is, you know, you have to be able to scale, right? These LLMs are dealing with multiple terabytes, hundreds of terabytes of, of data across systems that need to be running all the time. They need to have disaster recovery because as people build and deploy, and I know a lot of people are building kind of in development and prototyping right now, but it's, it's in order to move to, to production in due course. Uh, you have to have the security and confidence in the system as a whole uh, and it's also about combining different data types together different models together and i think in a way we haven't yet seen the revolution for data in the ai space because it's still all about vectors uh, or a single type of data but more and more people are trying to combine these different data stores together in order to improve the results improve the uh, the output, improve the reasoning of those LLMs. And that's where we're trying to, starting to see that the database is a much more important part of that tech stack than people might have thought so originally. Can you tell us about the name? How did you come up with the name Surreal DB? <laughs> what does it mean exactly? I'd love to have a good answer for that. I think it was my mum who came up with that, actually. Um, wow. But, I, you know, I think, yeah, I think, uh, I think, you know, we were trying to build something that really was pushing the boundaries of what's possible in a database. And I think still today, it's still pushing the boundaries of what people think is possible in a database. And, you know, what better name to say that than, you know, something that you, it describes something that you think is not possible or you think that is, you know, uh, it's, it's interesting. One, some of the concepts we get is, oh, you know, surreal, it's too good to be true. But actually when people use it, uh, we've had comments like, oh, the S in SQL now sounds for surreal QL, uh, which is our, <laughs> our query language name. But it's it's things like that. When people come to use the product and have and experience the developer experience of it, um, that actually the word surreal makes sense for what we're trying to achieve. Just because, before I ask my question, do you think you've gotten to that level or that point where it's actually surreal at surreal DB? <laughs> I mean, uh, you can see from the background, right? This isn't a green screen. Um, and this is what we, where we do all our streams and Discord AMAs and everything. And, yeah. you know, if the camera pans that way, if it could, the office is very pink. It's very on brand. Everything's pink. Everything is very oh. surreal. Uh, all of our Slack emojis are totally not normal, let's put it that way. So, uh, you know, we're trying to, it's not just about brand or, or marketing from an external point of view. We really do live the, live that internally. And you know, everything that we do in the organization is very bright, very uh, colorful, very surreal. And, and that goes down yeah. to the product itself. You know, it's, it's something that you, you wouldn't have imagined in your wildest dreams, but now it's there. We want to make it, you know, the best thing for developers. Okay. So, so you were talking about scale the other time and just arguments on both sides of the divide about whether scaling is going to really make LLMs get better and better and better. So I guess my question is just to see what, what you think about that conversation about scaling. Do you think scaling is going to get us to the point where LLMs are really, really good at what they're doing right now? Yeah, I think it's a it's a combination of both. I don't think it's just scaling one form of data. So, you know, obviously pushing them as many facts as possible and having as many facts as possible into, you know, pushing into an LM is, is going to be a good start, right? And it's going to get you a certain way, a certain uh, 
kind of success. But I think, and obviously scaling data in terms of, right, I want to have a, a, a chatbot or an agent inside an organization that can access the entire organization's emails and stock data and you know company-wide data let's say in order to formulate results that's obviously important right so so talking about data in a scale perspective is is important mm -hmm. but i think it's not just about scale it comes down to accuracy reproducibility and actually being able to say with confidence that this result is correct and this result mm -hmm. has come about in this way and i don't think you can just do that with facts that might match right pattern matching to an extent is only going to get you certain certain way of the way there it's about you know that's where graph and relationships and you know we we've we've seen that a lot of these uh vector databases they actually also suggest using full text search because full text search combined with vector search gives you better better results in the long term when you really combine vector search with full text search with graph and with time series data so that you can you can say look i have a set of facts and these set of facts get me to the starting point for this query but then i can work out from those those starting nodes and i can actually understand who might be related to this query or what information or what other facts or what other pieces of data might be related to this piece of information uh -huh. then i can start getting improved accuracy around that topic or around that initial search and then if you can say i want to access well, alongside that data i want to access events that have happened in the last minute because uh, you know that's very important to the question being asked uh -huh. or actually i need to see events that have happened across the entire company's lifetime because that's important to the question being asked so the llm being able to access effectively how our brain our human brains work right being able to access data depending on the question being asked uh -huh. is incredibly important if that is just facts it's hard to do that is in a way it's just a yeah. 2d information right it's 2d information but it's, it's a lot of it and it's able to access it very quickly but if you can add time series dimensions to it and graph dimensions to it you can turn that 2d information into 3d or, or 4d you know i know it's not a great example but in a way you're turning it you're adding other dimensions to it and that get can get you better better results, better performance of those results, and also can lead to better reproducibility and better understanding of how there's, uh, how the output of the LLM came about. Clearly, you're a British man with an English accent sitting in London. For our viewers in the US who have a hard time maybe thinking about the UK as an AI powerhouse or an AI leader, what can you tell them about some of the exciting things happening here in the UK? Yeah, I think... It's a good question. I think there's a, a you know a lot of good talent, engineering talent in the UK and Europe as well. I think that's very important, right? And so you know you're seeing more and more some very fast growing, uh, important in terms of from the infrastructure perspective, companies coming out of of Europe and UK. And of course, you know US is a very important market to those those organisations, those companies. Um, and of course, as we know, all know, a lot of innovation is happening in Silicon Valley, but there are more and more and i think it's become easier right because of you know because of the global pandemic because people are uh, were building where they where they were where they were based i think it's it's changed a little bit and actually there are great companies coming out of out of europe and the uk that said you know obviously the um the investment scene is very different over in the uk and, and in europe generally as a whole uh but there's some you know there's some great engineers there's some great tech being built and companies like nvidia uh, they want to be everywhere not just in the us so uh so that investment that outlook is is important as well um i think it's interesting that you're talking about talent because i that's also a challenge in the ai space today where um i mean there are concerns about um some sort of shortage do you think that's going to change going forward i think things are changing so quickly right you know like now you know the the ability to use AI to engineer certain parts of the tech stack is completely different to it was just even six months ago, or definitely more than a year ago. I think in terms of talent for AI, you know, this is I, I think you've got to split it into into the, what that talent is doing or what that talent is working on, right? You know, you've got the the core AI or machine learning and and deep machine learning and AI focused engineers. And you've got those people building on top of it. And I think for the first group, yeah, sure, we're going to see a, you know, there already is, um, you know, a small group that, that, that you know, the organizations are trying to recruit from. Uh, in terms of the developers building on top, 
that's a completely changing ecosystem as as AI eats into it or makes it easier to build as well. Um, I, I think in terms of it, again, it, it depends on what you're building. You know, if you're building something around uh, low level infrastructure or quantum or something where you know low level mathematics or understanding of AI is is a big part of what you're doing, then that's you know that's still not going to be replaced and, and is going to need great engineers. And there's always going to be a shortfall for those. Um, but the, the tech stacks on top, we're seeing that change every day. Yeah. Just one more question that just came to mind and, and then we'll, we're going to wrap this up. Um, of course we have to talk about AI agents, um, right. You know, because we now have AI agents that take actions that, you know, make decisions, pull data from everywhere within an organization. So, I guess this is something I've been curious about. So it's it's really great that you we're chatting today. How do you think that changes the role of the database? I think uh, I think we'll see this more as people are building applications that touch every aspect of their organization. Yeah, beforehand, it used to be an application that would you know when you touched as many different parts of your uh, your organization data stack, it would be like a dashboard. Whereas now it's an LLM that's trying to glean information and understanding of vast data sets. Um, so I think, you know, first of all, when you talk to a human, you expect to get an almost immediate response. Maybe that, in, that response hasn't got thinking behind it yet. So building on that response comes with time. Uh, but you, you get a response immediately. And I think that's what you expect when you talk to an LLM, right? You have to, you have to, uh, you, you expect something immediate uh -huh. you expect that that's something to be reasonably accurate uh and in order for that to happen you have to be able to have access to all of that data across the organization you have to be able to uh, understand the the temporal uh -huh. understand uh, the temporal aspect of that data you know when it happened how it happened what has changed since it happened you have to be able to un to analyze data that is related to other data sets you have to understand data in terms of facts so the database is becoming more and more important uh -huh. um, or, well, it is more important. It's just people haven't yet built that necessarily into their tech stacks. And it, it, it's more important from a size perspective. You know, we, we're trying to amass terabytes of data across organizations. You know, there are organizations out there running hundreds of petabytes of data or collecting petabytes of data every hour, every minute, every day. Um, and analyzing that data needs to happen at scale. But it, it's not just about analyzing it, as I said before, it's not just about analyzing it in a single dimension. You have to analyze it with, uh, you know, depending on the task that's being asked. And that, that comes with, you know, depending on the application, it comes with geo necessities or requirements. It comes with temporal requirements. It comes with graph requirements. It comes with traditional tabular uh, vectorized facts, as it were. But it, it comes with all of those. And I think combining those together, that's where organizations are going to see the biggest benefit. And, you know, you can do that with six, seven, eight different databases, or you can do that with fewer or even one in our case. And that makes it simpler to deploy, simpler to, to reason about, and then uh, simpler to manage. I think that was incredible. We're just going to wrap it up here. Thank you so much for taking us inside the reality of databases today and why they're going to be more and more important for the future of AI. No, thank you. It's been great. And thank you to everyone listening. This is Machine Dreams. More conversations with people shaping the future of AI are on the way. See you next time.